This is Get Real with Deb Waterbury, a show where Dr. Deb gets real as she teaches through books and studies on topics relevant for today. And now, here is your host, Dr. Deb Waterbury. Welcome to week six of Tired of Standing. It's our study of First Peter. This has been, um, I, I love this book, and I said this at the very beginning of this series. Anytime I'm feeling particularly run down, uh, and I titled this Tired of Standing because sometimes you just t- get tired. You want to sit down, and, and you want to not just physically tired, and yeah, that happens too, but you just get tired of standing on, these, on the Word of God, and just to be quite frank, because it can just be difficult. It's difficult to stand on what God calls you to do so often. And it's difficult to continue to stand in this world. There are so many ramifications of standing all the time. Sometimes you just want to sit down. And so I, you know, when I start feeling that way, particularly, I will always read First Peter. It is, um, it reminds me of, of my call. It reminds me of what I'm to, how I'm to behave. And it reminds me of why I'm to behave that way. But most especially, number four, it reminds me that God's got my back. And I I think I just need, you know, sometimes we just need to be reminded. Reminded of what to do, how to do it, why you do it, and what happens when you do it. Um, We just have to be reminded of that. And 1 Peter does that. So last week and this week, we were talking about submission. And I want to move a little bit further into that in our passage for today. Last week, we talked about submitting to our government or to those in those institutional authorities over us. This week, I want to talk about submitting to the situations in our lives um, and understanding that God, submitting to God, and then what that looks like to submit to others. So we're going to we have two passages today that I'm going to cover as quickly as I possibly can. They both talk about submission, and the, and the real overarching thing is that we submit to God in all of this, but it's going to give us a good why first in this first passage and gives and then the second passage will give us another instruction about how we do that to one another in particular within the marriage relationship you know the reason why and we're going to it's in in chapter three verses one through seven and you know when i'm talking to women who are having problems with their husbands maybe not behaving appropriately they might be unbelievers whatever i always point them to first peter chapter three verses one through six um, because it is such a good instruction specifically for how a woman should behave in that situation. But what you need to understand, and when we get to that, I'll say this again, the passage, even though it's speaking directly to wives and husbands, really has an overarching effect on all relationships. Understanding that the very first human relationship ever in existence was between a husband and a wife. That is the springboard for all of our other relationships. So often when, we, when we're in the Bible and we see and we come to these passages that speak about how a husband and a wife should respond and behave toward one another, we want to limit that to just the marriage relationship. And the truth is that those fundamental things that we do within the marriage are springboards for the way we, re- we respond in all relationships. Understanding that relationship was the beginning relationship and then brought forth all, re- all the rest of them. So it makes sense that if I could figure out how to treat my husband and my husband could figure out how to treat me, then we could figure out how to treat everybody else. This really is the fund- found- foundational thing there. So when I get to that in a minute, about submitting both one to the other. What The reason it's not so much, although it's very important about how you submit to your husband and vice versa, it is more about how then you can develop that attitude of submission so that you don't become the center of your own existence and therefore you can submit to everyone in love. Um, and by that, I don't mean you become their slaves. That's not what submit means. That means sub- it, this submit means to subject or to honor, respect. Okay, so... The passages that I want to look at today is we're going to be covering chapter 2, verses 18 through chapter 3, verse 7. And again, like I said, this is two separate passages. The first one is chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. So let me read that to you right quick. Um, And this really is about the nature of our calling in the midst of suffering, knowing who we're submitting to in the first place. So verses 18 through 25 of uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. All right, verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer, 
for, and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. That's a big sentence right there. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's God. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now I return to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. So this passage begins with almost a, a boss-employee relationship. I know it says master and servant here. That's just within that time frame. It really is speaking to that relationship. And, and basically what Peter is setting up here is that you are to respond, not eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Respond in, you know, I'm going to stand up for myself. And if you're treating me poorly, then I'm going to treat you poorly in return, even if it's your boss. What he's saying is, you know, what credit does it get you if somebody treats you nicely and then you treat them nicely in return? I mean, anybody can do that. Paul says at one time, and um, I think it's Galatians, he says, even the Gentiles do that. Even the heathens do that. But, what, but it is more to your credit whenever someone reviles you or treats you terribly, a boss that's unjust, a friend who's been mean, people who treat you badly, and then you respond to them kindly. That's what gets you credit in the eyes of the Lord. And so, and what, you know, he says here is that's the nature of our calling. And I stopped at that verse because he very succinctly says that in verse 19, this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly to this, we have been called and, and, and understand, you know, what I just read right then, you, when you do the right thing, you're going to suffer. You know, I, I, I so many people, and I know I do the same, do the same thing, but I did everything right. I, I did everything the way I was supposed to do it. Why, why is everything not working out? Why, is, why are people mistreating me? Well, you know, obviously we just skimmed right over the part of the Bible that says, when you do the right thing, you will suffer. Now, it takes a perspective to be able to move into that appropriately. Amen? I mean, to know that, because we, we want to be rewarded for our good behavior. We want to, if we do the right thing, we think things ought to work out. You know, one of the things I said to my small group not long ago was, you need to leave behind this notion that when you do the right things, it's all going to work. Because that's not what you're promised. What you're promised is you do the right thing because God is the just judge and you're doing it as unto him. You don't do the right thing so that everything works out in your brain or in your life or in the circumstances. As a matter of fact, the Bible clearly tells us that when you do the right things for God, you're going to get some backlash and things aren't going to work out. They might in the short run, but for eventually something bad's going to happen. You know this. So doing the right thing, you can't do what's right with that predetermined ulterior motive of I'm going to do this right thing and then God's going to make sure everything works out. You're going to be so disappointed and you're going to be so bitter eventually. That's not what you're guaranteed and that's not why we do the right thing. And that's, that's what Peter's saying to us right now. We're called to do the right thing because it is for God. Why are we called? The answer again is in, in verse 21. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. We're called to this because Jesus suffered for me and he suffered for you and he suffered every injustice and pain known. You know, of course he did the right thing. God, Jesus is God. He, he left his throne in heaven and subjected himself to being human coming from the poorest family, from the worst place, Nazareth. Nobody wanted to come from Nazareth. I think the saying was nothing good ever comes out of Nazareth. So he, 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 he literally submitted himself to all of that and then doing the right thing, coming here, living a perfect life, and then dying on the cross for us. Every right thing he did was, was, was um, responded to by reviling and torture and meanness and horrible. I mean, so if he's our example and he did all that for you and I, then obviously this is an example we should follow. You know, um, he, he did this because he was standing in our place. He did what, what we couldn't do. He stood in our place and he gave us an example of how we should live. 
And Peter spelled that example out in verses 22 and 23. He said he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. This is our calling. Our calling is not to hurt back, not to plan to hurt back, and not to seethe in bitterness because we're not allowed to hurt back. <laughs> that's, that's my call. My call is to do the right thing, not to retaliate, not to think about retaliating, and not to get angry because I can't retaliate. That's, that's my call is to do it for something greater than that. And I'm doing the right thing because this is my example. Jesus, who suffered and did everything for me, did it that way. And, you know, verse 19 tells us to be mindful of God. And he says to be mindful of God because he's the one that I'm submitting to. It's his justice. He's the one who's, God is the one who's going to judge everybody, not me. And the Bible says this over and over again. I submit to God. I do these things. I suffer. I do the right thing. Everything doesn't work out, even though I do the right thing. And I do the right thing because Jesus was my example. He did all that for me. And I'm submitting to God because he is the just judge. If Jesus could submit to God as the just judge in terms of what he suffered, I think I can too. And I think you can too. And that's our call. Peter said, this is your call. Now, moving on to the next section, and this is one of those sections that sometimes people don't like to read. Again, I tell you, I, I refer women to this one all the time, but you have to be able to see what's being said here and apply it appropriately. So uh, this one's about submitting to each other, even though Peter is speaking specifically to the marriage relationship and how a wife and a husband then submit to one another and respect one another. He's, um, he's, he's really moving because he's, been, he's been talking all along. You have to understand, remember, no chapter and verse divisions in this letter. This is just a letter he wrote. And he's been talking all along about submission and about suffering and about why you suffer and how you should treat people while you're suffering. So he's just continuing in that thought. You know, even in the marriage and all your relationships, this is how you respond. So it's not like he stopped right now and went, you know what, I need to talk to wives right quick. He didn't say that. This is one continuous thought about submission, about suffering, about why we do the right thing. And this is just another example, which is just another relationship. So let me look really quickly with you at verses 1 through 7 of chapter 3 in 1 Peter. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adornment be your adornment. Um, do not let your adorning, sorry, be external, the braiding of hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of clothing. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now again, um, this understand this prayer and what Peter is writing here is a call for all of us to understand how to relate to everyone. But he's using the marriage relationship as an example. So I want to go to the specifics as I then move into the, to the general here. So when he says wives submit to your own husbands, um, it'd be easy. Wouldn't it be wonderful <laughs> if if we all had husbands that were like number seven, <laughs> that, that honored us. And when he, under we said with the weaker vessel, he's not talking about spiritually weaker. He's just talking about the fact that women are physically weaker than men. So he's just saying, when, it'd be nice, women, it'd be great if we all had husbands that acted like number seven's verse. And I'm sure husbands said it'd be really great if women all acted like <laughs> the rest of those verses. We don't, we don't though, do we? And we, we have to understand that, um, that submission even though it's one of those words we don't want to think about, really is about um, honoring an order, honoring an order in terms of how God created things. You know, there is, within the home, there has to be some kind of order, some kind of who's the head, who's the leader. If you have more than one leader, you, what's that old saying, can't have more than one cook in the kitchen? Well, it's the same anywhere. You've got to have someone who's the head. You know, if you think about it in your, in your work situation, Everybody has a boss. I don't look at my boss and think that my boss is better than me because he, he or she's the boss. 
that's just their position. I, my position is here. Their position is there. Their position is to lead. My position is to lead other areas. We all lead in some way or another. So it's just your position within the realm of that institution. It doesn't mean one is better than the other. So we have to understand. I think what we do is we try to take that word submission and we stick it in with the word slave. And they're not the same thing. Submitting is honoring, respecting a role. Submitting to what your role is as opposed to their role. And so what Peter is starting here with when he says, wives, submit to your own husbands, he's saying, you know, in general to all of us, we should all do this in ordering the person who is in the role over us. That doesn't mean they're better than we are. It just has to be some order. And he's saying, you need to submit to that. This is God's created order. He created men as headship within the family. So, you know, in that created order, there has to be some kind of, of, of submission in terms of that. I love how John Piper put this. He talked about submission in a marriage, and it's such a great quote. I have to quote. He said, submission is the disposition to follow a husband's authority and an inclination to yield to his leadership. It is an attitude that says, I delight for you to take the initiative in our family. I am glad when you take the responsibility for things and lead with love. I don't flourish when you are a passive and I have to make sure the family works. But the attitude of Christian submission also says, it grieves me when you venture into sinful acts and want to take me with you. You know I can't do that. I have no desire to resist you. On the contrary, I flourish most when I can respond creatively and joyfully to your lead, but I can't follow you into sin. As much as I love to honor your leadership in our marriage, Christ is my king. And so what that, and that's so great because that, that's, the, that's the idea of that headship in the perfect situation. We're not always in those perfect situations. And so Peter's saying, instead of beating people over the head with the stuff that you say, we are, and this is true of, and you know, you can, t again, take this out of the marriage relationship. You will evangelize better by the way that you behave than the things that you say. You can talk about Jesus all you want. If you act like a pain in the rear end, nobody's going to listen to you. It's the same with, and he's saying, wives, you, this is how you're going to win your husbands, either back to the Lord or back to good behavior or to the Lord. Don't beat them over the head with the words. They will be won to Christ by your pure and winsome. That word winsome means kind of winning, uh, pure, sweet conduct. It's it's in it's in your behavior, and again, that's how we evangelize too. Um, you know, and when he goes on and he says things like about you know, don't let your adornment be the gold in your hair, or whatever. He's not saying to you women that you can't wear jewelry. Praise God. He's not saying that we don't wear nice clothes or fix ourselves up or whatever makes you feel good about this temple that God has given you. He's saying that that can't be the source of who you are in Christ. He said, when you are moving toward a la bringing someone to Christ, be that your husband, your children, the people around you, your neighbors, it can't be about what they see here. It has to be about what they see coming out of here. So he's saying, let your adornment, let the thing that makes you beautiful be your heart. Let the thing that makes you so beautiful that people want to be with you, your husband, your children, whatever, and they want to be like you, they want to have what you have. Don't let it be about something they see. Let it be about something that they see you do, some way they see you act, the way they see you respond. Can you see where this, even though he's talking about a wife with her husband here, it can be about how a believer speaks and acts in an unbelieving world. It is don't let them think that they're going to see Jesus by looking at your outward, um, your outward appearance, um, even though obviously we want to take care of this temple. But that's not where they see Jesus. They see Jesus in your heart and how that's manifested. And that's what he's talking about over and over here again. And he said, you know, God, he said, the, the holy women of God who, um, who hoped in God, your, your strength here is God. Finding the strength in who he is is what will allow that to happen. Being gentle, being quiet, being fearless, you know, and then understanding what he says to the husband at the end where he says, live with your wives in an understanding way. You know, one of the things that we, we have to understand in the Bible is that God never commands a woman to love her husband. And he never commands a husband to respect his wife. Because he knows that you and I as women, if there are women who are watching me, we love, love is what we do. Men, if you're watching, you know respect, showing that respect, that kind of comes natural to you. We have to be commanded to do the opposite. I have to be commanded to respect, and men have to be commanded to love because that's not our natural thing. And so basically he's just telling women, 
You need to respect your husband because this is the order. And husbands, you need to love your wives. Paul will say later on in Ephesians chapter 5, you've got to love your wife as Jesus loves the church for crying out loud. That's, that's some serious, that means you will die for her. That means you would give up everything and go to any punishment just so that she would know the beauty of Jesus and know the beauty of salvation and the beauty of good life. That's, that's a big love. But he has to command that of you. Same as he has to command of us to respect the order that he has placed in, in situations like our homes. Um, this, uh, this submission, this submitting in relationships, submitting to your boss, the way he started that very first verse that we went over, submitting to our relationship to our husbands or wives, those, that is, is, a, is an outpouring of a heart already submitted to God. And, and once we have done so, then God's created order, headship in the home, boss-employee relationship, the institutions of government, whatever, whether you like it or not, somebody's over you all the time. Somebody's in charge of you. They are the boss of you. You can say you're not the boss of me. Somebody's the boss of you. Submitting in those situations is always going to become from a heart that is already submitted to God because your perspective is outside of this. Your perspective moves beyond this temporal and we are people of eternity. So our perspective is what's happening there and how we move in that eternity and move in that eternity from the way that we look at things. Submission in humility is always going to be paramount for the believer in every single relationship. We do it because Jesus did it first. And, and that's, our par- that's our prime example of what we should do and why we should do it and then how we should do it. Uh, it's, it's never going to be easy, but it is, it is something that we can do if you trust in God first. Pray for you. Pray for me. We're going to pray for each other, love each other, submit in love to God in all things. And I'll just see you next time. God bless you. Thank you for joining me today on this episode of Get Real with Deb Waterbury. I hope you were blessed and I hope you got some information that's going to help you get through your day. If you want any more information on any of my books or my articles or on any of my future speaking engagements, you can find all that information at debwaterberry.com. God bless you.